I'm very glad here to present to you today, Dr. Tasos Kiriakidis. He's a biostatistician and an epidemiologist, an associate research scientist at Yale University, and he is a member of the advisory panel of the Olive Wellness Institute and a proponent of the Yale Olive Institute. How are you doing, Dr. How are you doing, Dr. Tassos? Good morning. Good morning. I'm doing really well. Uh, bright and early here in my office in uh, in West Haven, Connecticut. That's great. That's amazing. Here it's about midday here in Cyprus. So I want to begin with um, what could you tell us a bit about your career and uh, what it is exactly that you do? Um, thanks. First of all, thanks for having me on this, and it's it's an amazing initiative you're doing to to sort of have people uh, talk about what they do and and, and sort of in the in the pro, in the process, uh, hopefully uh, get people interested in in different careers and different thought processes in in the healthcare field or in general in in any any field. So my career was an interesting one. I started out. Um, with the idea of um, maybe at some point becoming a physician, a doctor. Um, and I uh, went to UCLA uh, and got my degree in, in uh, biochemistry. And I thought the next step would be medical school. Um, but um, it was um, summer of 1991. I was sitting outside um, on campus at a coffee place uh, when Magic Johnson announced that he was HIV positive. And that was a turning point in my career uh, and I said, well, I'm not going to go into medicine. I'm going to do something similar to that, but with hopefully bigger impact. So I decided to go into public health. And I started taking classes at UCLA, the School of Public Health there. And that turned my interest into public health, epidemiology, and biostatistics that I'm doing now. So 25 years later, uh, here I am doing what started back in 1991. Wow, that's that's an amazing journey. Um, so, what is it exactly that a biostatistician does? So, the um, there's, I mean, there's different roles that a biostatistician can take. The way we are functioning here, in both at the Yale School of Public Health, at the Yale Center for Analytical Sciences, and the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Cooperative Studies Program, which is a, a clinical a, re, uh, a clinical trials uh, center. Um, the biostatistician is involved from the beginning of designing a project. If there's a question from the clinical side of of of, um, of the sort of the the, the organization, and, and there's a question that needs to be answered, then the biostatistician uh, helps design a project. Um, to answer the questions that are posed, uh, meaning uh, determining how many participants you need in a project, how much data you need to pull, and what kind of data, and how you structure the, the data in a way that you can answer the question after you pose the hypothesis and run the analysis to present uh, Salute, uh, to present the conclusions based on that data. Um, so that's sort of the main role of the biostatistician. And another role that uh, usually it's not well uh, highlighted is the biostatistician monitors along the way the progress of a, pro of a, of a project to make sure if there's changes that are happening as you go along, you have to adapt and change the protocol and the operational aspects of that proposal. So it's not just running numbers, but you have to have a good understanding of the background and the and the sort of the content uh, as new things come in, as things move and change, as you see more data accumulating, how do you act on it and what do you do in order to be able to answer the question at the end of the day? So I'm guessing when we say like, studies come out and say this percentage of people have this and this is correlate with that this is all about biostatistics yes yeah it's uh i i think you know we're, we're in a day and age where there's tons of data they're flying around everywhere um there's even specialties now working on big data uh and that that's a different whole different topic what is big data but the the bottom line is that we have so much data and i think care should be taken not only how we use the data but how we interpret the data because data if you, if you think about it data is agnostic it doesn't have any any preference on how it's going to be presented but it's us who have to present it the right way to extract the right conclusions and uh, we've all seen things that are if you look at it one way that's not the correct way of interpreting the data, you can draw the wrong conclusions and that's the last thing you want to do. And so that's part of the role and the task of a biostatistician or statistician in general uh, is how do you present the data in a comprehensible way, but also data that, re but in a way that presents a, uh, the, the accuracy of what the data is telling you. Uh, and data visualization is actually a big, big field 
And there's many examples where you can take the same data set and you can present one way versus the other and clearly you can get a different message. And that's that's a, an art in itself. And I'm guessing this is where um, media comes in place and they get some stuff and then they change it up and uh, you get some weird messages out there. Yep. Uh, and, and, and we've all seen, and unfortunately during this pandemic, we've all seen the highlights, whether it's newspapers or, or radio or TV, they extract sort of the sensational title. But underneath that, there's a lot more that's there that's not presented. And, um, but unfortunately, you know, if, if, if you have 10 seconds of somebody's attention, you're going to try to capture their attention for your own agenda. But it shouldn't be that way. There should be some um, sort of a, a filter of what should be presented at that headline because that's what people grab at the first sight or the first hearing. And you have to be careful what you do with that because you don't want to give the wrong impression based on the wrong conclusions. Uh, because not a lot of people will take the time to read the whole article, for example. So you have to make sure that bring out the message that you want to give, but make sure it reflects what the data is telling you. Mm -hmm. What do you advise people to do, let's say, if they come across, when they come across a title like this, a big and shining red lights, let's say, and it says something, what do you advise them to do? Is there like, could they go somewhere to double check information, read the whole article? I, I mean, I would suggest read the whole article uh, and, and, and look into how the data was presented, how the data was collected. Uh, and if there's questions, obviously, I mean, I've done it many times. I reach out to the person who wrote it, uh, the article, whether it's an article or, or, a, or a newspaper article or something, just to get an understanding of where is this data coming from that you extracted sometimes selectively some things but didn't show other things. Um, I mean, the other day, I, I um, somebody um, sent me uh, sort of a, an image of, of a of some data presented about vaccine hesitancy, for example. And it was one of many slides in an article. So I asked for the source. I went to the source. And actually, to me, there was an even more important slide that should have been presented that uh, would help understand why uh, we have hesitancy or, or reservations about taking a vaccine. So to me, that was a message, but it didn't come across because if you select to show one part of the of the of the of the work that was done, then you might be missing something important. So I had to go to that source to find it. Uh, so look for the source, write to the person who wrote it or the people who wrote it, and try to get an understanding uh, of what they're presenting and how they collected it. Nice. I wanted to ask you. I'm interested. What what was the reason why people were hesitant? Um, over thirty. It was a study. It actually, it was a survey done in the U.S. About thirty thousand um, uh, random selection um, with you know very well designed survey uh, by a big organization, um, and it was done in April. And the top two reasons were uh, one: about thirty six percent of the people said uh, they're worried about side effects, and twenty nine percent. That was the second highest reason was because they thought the clinical trials went too fast. Um, so to me, and there's a bunch of other reasons, obviously, uh, but they never, nothing else rose above the 10% sort of threshold. Everything was, was below that. Um, but to me, that spoke a lot because for many reasons. One, um, those are addressable concerns. Um, again, using data that's accumulated ever since to address those two points. Uh, and I think there's, uh, and I've said it before, as public health, uh, we failed to some degree in communicating clearly and transparently to the, to the, to, to people, whether it's uh, locally, nationally, or globally. Uh, and, and we've seen a lot of examples of messages not coming across clearly. So these two reasons were very easy to address based on data that's accumulated. And there's a good explanation for both of them. Uh, because obviously, um, there's concerns that people raise. We have to hear those concerns, but at the same time, present the data the way that's, that's accumulated and let people see what's what's out there. Um, and and I want to go back to the point that public health in general, as I said, I think we failed to some degree. And part of it, I think, is um, we have not done a good job historically of training people in public health in communication. Health communication is lacking. Uh, I mean, I can present my work at conferences at, at various places, but who attends those is my peers. My peers understand what I'm talking about. The, uh, the, the hard part is communicating 
those messages and what you see from the data to people who are not in the field. Uh, and that's the hard part. And, and it's a hard, it's a hard um, issue to address. And I think it has to start from schools of public health and schools of medicine that teach public health professionals and, and health professionals how to communicate. Uh, we're lacking in that. Uh, there, there's a few places uh, that are leaders in this field, but if, if I look across the U.S. at least, premier schools of public health do not have a, uh, a focus on health communication. There's no track. There's no specialty. You take a course here and there, but there's no health communication. I think that should be an important component of anybody's education um, because you can present what you what you what you see in the data. Um, people will understand if they are in sort of the field or related field fields but um the the bulk of the of the message the bulk of the people who are receiving these messages are not in the field so we have to do better no i totally understand that and like from my perspective i'm a third year medical student now is i've the only thing that we've been told is don't use medical jargon and that's yep. it i think that's a bit vague <laughs> yeah that's very vague I mean, that, so what do you use i mean it, there's there's a whole art of communicating and, and you can see the same message in different ways uh, and it has a different impact. Uh, and I, I think we have a long way to go, but that's where it begins. I think education at the schools where uh, health, current and future health healthcare professionals are trained, we need to put emphasis on health communication. And I think like well, the reason, one of the reasons why I've done this podcast is this, because um, I want people to get the information directly from the source, not from um, articles, etc. And yeah, it, it makes the people feel closer to the yep. doctors and to the health professionals, to the researchers, etc. Yeah, I, I think you know part of that is the understanding that, and again, using the context of the pandemic that has occupied all our lives, and, and whether personal or work-wise, um, the part of that is the the understanding that uh, we're all new to this; we've never experienced it before. Nobody was alive in 1918 when we had the Spanish flu epidemic. So it's something new. And the first time I started pulling data from our state here, uh, I had a deja vu from my graduate school days when I was looking at epidemic curves. I'm like, this is textbook. Uh, I'm seeing it in real life. So I think that what we, and again, goes back to sort of where is our failure as public health, as a profession, as a, as a field. Uh, it's okay to say, I don't know. I've never seen this before. I don't know what's coming. Uh, but trying to to guess or say things that are not based on, on factual evidence and, and data is actually uh, harmful. Um, so we have to step back and say, I don't know the answer. It's okay to say that. And if you do something and you, you interpret something, you say something, and it proves with the accumulation of more data that you were wrong, you have the responsibility to come back and say, I was wrong. Now I'm going to correct it. So, because um, it's always easy to look back and say, well, I told you so. Well, data will guide you to the conclusion. So it's okay to say, to admit that I was wrong with that assumption. I was wrong with that conclusion because I didn't have the data. Now that I have data, I can see better. And I think people appreciate that honesty and transparency instead of sort of uh, getting the sense that you're hiding something or telling them something that might not be reflective of what you're seeing. No, I agree with that. Like I'm a hundred percent. And it, it's something that you don't see people come up and say, no, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Something. Yeah. There's an interesting, um, you know, the, especially people who have, uh, who are positions who, where people look for them to say something. Um, there's, there's something to be said about the, the power of no, you have to, to be able to say, yes, I know all this, but no, I don't know this. Uh, you have to be, and that I think is is uh, service to 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 the public, and you owe it to them. And it's humbling, though. It's humbling to say that, and I think that might be a reason why people don't do it. They want to feel that you know, I I know the answer to everything, and yeah. coming out and saying no, I don't know that. It's a bit humbling. Um, okay, I want to move on to the Olive Wellness Institute. Yeah. Uh, could you tell us a bit about what you do there, and yeah, what it's all about? Yeah. So uh, that's, uh, I mean, I, I think I, I, as I'm getting older, I, I'm tracing back my trajectory and what I've done and what I've, I've been involved in. And, and the, the involvement with olive oil started um, obviously coming from a, a Mediterranean background. Olive oil was part of our 
upbringing anyway. But, um, uh, and I always had an interest, both personal, because I enjoy that kind of food and Mediterranean food and, and olive oil. But uh, professionally, in 2006, uh, I, I organized here a set of um, panel discussions, people involved in the Mediterranean food, um, from um, physicians, public health people, nutritionists, and chefs and soci- sociologists and social workers um, because there's a common theme there and meeting people from different aspects of the Mediterranean nutrition spectrum, I, I realized, well, the, the, what is the main ingredient here? Uh, what is the, the pillar of Mediterranean nutrition is olive oil. So mm-hmm. from that, I embarked on something that I, I didn't know where it was going to land and um, mid, mid to late 2016-17, I, I went um, I, out of a whim. I said I got to learn more about olive oil, not from a from a um, from a um, uh, sort of a chemistry or from a uh, an academic perspective, but also who are people who are going to train me and teach me how to appreciate olive oil in a different way. Uh, so I, I did a week long training at the, the International Culinary Center in New York, uh, where I I was exposed to 300, 400 different oils great teachers from people who mill the oil, the, the, the olives, to tasters, to um, to producers. So I, I got involved in a lot in that world. And out of that, uh, I came out, I, I said, something's going to happen. I don't know what. So I let it sit for a while with me. And uh, a year later, I walked into the office of um, a colleague of mine at the school, the chair of the environmental health sciences at the School of Public Health. And I said, we got to do something about olive oil. It's unheard of for a school of public health, uh, such as Yale, not to have something focusing on Mediterranean nutrition and more specifically olive oil. So I embarked on this idea of starting a, an olive institute here at Yale that will focus on research education, community engagement, anything that has to do with the olive trainers products. So during that time, I was approached by um, uh, the uh, an Australian group that was putting together the so-called Olive Wellness Institute. Uh, and they were looking for people who are interested from a different perspective and had knowledge of the of olive oil, uh, or the olive tree and its products, uh, in helping them uh, sort of in their education campaigns, in their putting out facts. Uh, because there's a lot of myths about olive oil that we've all seen, and, and um, one of their goals was educate um, their people, not only in Australia, but but globally. So I, I started serving on their advisory panel ever since, uh, and which, you know, the, the idea of our institute here is to be an umbrella organization that brings in people, no matter where they are, and no matter what area they're working, whether they're in the, in the field, they're producers, exporters, distributors, organizations, academ- academia, any any organization foundation we partner with them and we do things uh and i think having an institute at a at, a, at, a, at, a, at an academic institution with, with the the sort of the 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 name i think helps but uh we came in and said there's things that we can do well here at yale but definitely there's things that we don't know how to do because we don't have the capacity so why reinvent the wheel why don't we partner with others our school our motto is innovation through collaboration. And that's exactly what we're doing. Um, I, as I started talking to people all over the world, I, I I will never forget, I talked to somebody at a university in Chile. And um, during the conversation, she goes, well, we have a six-month course for all our medical students on Mediterranean nutrition. Wow. I've never heard of that before. Even in Mediterranean, sometimes in Mediterranean countries, we don't have that, uh, let alone the U.S. So I said, okay. Um, so I started looking into their syllabus. And, and now any any other university that wants to do that, they are happy to share how they're doing it and why they're doing it. Uh, so that, that gives you an example of what what our intent or our objective is. So the Olive Wellness Institute is, came along as part of that as I started uh conversing with people in Australia. It's been a great experience. We have a physician from the UK who's serving on the panel, a couple of people from the US, um, nutritionists and um, uh, researchers um, you know, here and obviously people from Australia. So it, it's, it's, a very, um, it's a very alive conversation every time we have meetings because everybody brings their own perspective uh, and, and sort of that pushes the envelope. Because at the end of the day, I mean, one thing that we always forget, whether it's this or anything else we do, uh, by definition, if you're researching something, uh, you're searching again. Uh, that, that's what the word means. You're researching. Um, because if we are able to answer every single question we had with one experiment, with one project, with one study, 
we would not be doing anything more. Just you answer the question, that's it. Why? But the pursuit of knowledge through research, I think, is continuous. It never ends. That's why we have to keep learning and be informed by the data we're collecting in these projects because that informs the previous one. And, and that pushes the envelope. So we, we and whether it's you're in education, whether you're in any any field that you're in, you're always looking to improve. You're always striving to, for improving while maintaining the integrity and the quality of your project or your, your study, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even like second guessing the data that you already have. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, there's, um, I mean, definitely, I mean, that's part of the, the whole process is that y y you have to step back and say, okay, because if you're in a project that, that you drive, obviously you have a vested interest to, 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 to understand the data, but it's always good to step away and say, okay, what is this really telling me? Um, and and reanalyze the data and look at it a different way and give it to other people to analyze because you mm -hmm. might be analyzing it in one way, but somebody else might say, well, I want to look at it that way. And that, creates a new question that creates a new interpretation um but again as long as you you follow what the data is telling you um you'll get to a point where you feel comfortable that this is what what i'm seeing here let's go back to the olive institute like yep. i've seen your website and their website and it's it's, it's kind of amazing like i'm going yep. to put it in the description of the video so people can go in it it's uh, it's got a lot of factual information on it it's very interesting um, I wanted to ask, uh, what what, the, um, what does the Mediterranean diet consist of? Because well, we say Mediter it. Yeah, I mean, the Mediterranean, uh, I, 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 it's something that I always um, um, like try to, to add my, my two cents when people use the word diet. I mean, not, 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 I'm not judging you for using it because everybody's using it. Uh, and we have a lot of interesting um, discussions and back and forth with um with my friend Simon Poole, who's a physician out of, uh, of, of the UK. Um, and diet to me, the, the connotation, there's some connotation that there's a restriction of something because it became the use of the word, you know, it's this diet and that diet and the other diet. Uh, I don't think you'll find somebody who's, who's uh, a good, um, who follows the Mediterranean nutrition to tell you that they're being deprived of anything, whether it's meat, fish, veggies, uh, or anything else. So uh, Mediterranean nutrition is a, is a lot of plant, it's a plant-based, if you think about it, it's a plant-based diet with, um, you know, legumes and um, some grains, um, definitely um, a, a smaller amount of meats that we've seen in other diets, uh, Western diets, uh, fish. But at the center of all this is the, um, the olive oil. Uh, if you look at the consumption of olive oil in the three major Mediterranean countries, let's say, that are olive oil producing, Spain, Italy, and Greece, it's, you know, by far uh, exceeds any, any, any comparison. I mean, the U.S., if we're consuming one liter per person per year, you're looking at Spain and Italy with 12 to 13 and Greece with 25. Um, wow. So that that and and sort of interesting, you know, uh, anecdotes from discussing with people. I had a conversation with um, Antonia Trichopoulou, who's uh, her husband and herself have been the pillars and, and the, the leaders in in promoting Mediterranean nutrition through their research over the last 30, 40 years or so. And uh, we were at dinner one one day and um, a couple of Italians and Spanish and, and us. And she goes, you think that we Greeks like um, veggies more than you guys in Spain and Italy. If you take broccoli, it just tastes the same to us as to you. But what we do, we have them bathe in olive oil and it tastes better. That's why we eat a lot more. <laughs> so, which is, you know, it took me by, it's like, yeah, she has a point. I mean, it's not like if you take the, the whatever the vegetable is, it's not like I like it better than a Spaniard. But if I covered with olive oil and I flavor it with that, then I it becomes more appealing to me. So uh, Mediterranean nutrition is sort of, um, you have a lot of plant-based uh, components. Uh, there, there's no, there's no, nothing to say don't eat meat, but eat meat every seven days, every 10 days, not every, not every day. Uh, it, it more fish and seafood, uh, but definitely uh, veggies, uh, legumes, um, the hearty grains, um, that give you a low glycemic index. So it, it's a it's a it's a composition of a lot of these uh, things that we know that individually are beneficial for your own health. But then put it together, now you have a Mediterranean dish. You and, see, um, yeah. 
You said beneficial for your own health in what ways? Well, it's been shown that uh, as a whole, the Mediterranean nutrition is very beneficial for, you know, a lot of, of um, uh, health indicators, whether it's cardiovascular, whether it's um, 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 cancer, whether it's um, um, even mental health. Uh, there's a lot of studies coming out now that uh, a positive impact on, on diseases, uh, degenerative diseases um, as you grow older. Alzheimer's, for example, it's people who are on uh, the risk of developing diseases like that are much lower if you're consuming uh, Mediterranean nutrition um, as, as a whole, but then you can pinpoint it to particular ingredients. Again, I want to go back to olive oil because it's been shown that um, whether, again, cardiovascular, uh, vascular diseases, uh, um, tumors, um, uh, mental health. So it, it, it's across the board that uh, it's something that's very beneficial for you to consume at, at considerable amounts. Uh, no wonder the, the European Union has a health claim on uh, the antioxidant capacity of olive oil. And people can put it on the label of the extra virgin olive oil that you have that health claim. And similar here in the US, the FDA has given that health, the same health claim. So it, so it's, it's it's evidence. There's evidence there that it's, it's something healthy for you. Uh, and many, many studies, different kinds of designs have shown time and again, uh, and stood the test of time. It's, you know, from the seven country studies that were in the 70s, um, and then Creed was one of the places, and there was other six places in the world, shown that um, people who are um, adhering to that kind of nutrition have every possible benefit you can imagine uh, for health. I mean, olive oil is a major antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, and it's been shown both in the lab, because you can extract things and show what the impact is, but um, just anecdotally, you know, a tablespoon of, of olive oil is the equivalent of 300 or so milligrams of a, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Uh, of course, you know, you're not going to take a, a, a spoon of olive oil to, uh, for your headache to go away. It's a long term. Uh, so it's not like a, take my, my, my shot of olive oil once and that's it. And you have to continuously uh, maintain use of that in your, in your daily uh, nutrition. When you say considerable amount of olive oil every day, how much? Well, the, the health claim right now is based on uh, a, a tablespoon of olive oil. If you take a tablespoon of olive oil, you get sort of the, the, the benefit you get from the antioxidant capacity. Now, um, an, I mean, a, a, a tablespoon of olive oil is, is for people from, again, from the Mediterranean that are used to consuming vast amount of olive it's oil. That's nothing. nothing. Yeah. I mean, one. Uh, I mean, one tablespoon is is barely what you put on a salad. Uh, exactly. Let alone the other things that you cook with. So. Okay, and continue, continue. I mean, the. Um, I mean, one of the things that we're trying to do here in the as part of the institute initiative is, um, like I said, as a university, we have three pillars: one, research education, and community engagement, because. You do research, you get something out of it, you educate people how to absorb that information and how to utilize it, but then you have to engage the community. Otherwise, your, your application implementation of what you've learned stays within the, the confines of the academic setting. So one of the things we're trying to do as part of this is, is educate people about what the, a lot of myths have been going around about olive oil, you know, historically and for many, many reasons. And here we we see it a lot. You don't see it as much in... in Spain, Italy, Greece, you know, the Mediterranean, Northern African countries, and the Middle East, where olive oil is used. Um, and it's always uh, sort of a, it took me a few times to hear people ask the same question to the, realize that's a big problem. I mean, you cannot fry it with olive oil. And I always sort of take a step back. It's like, why? Who said that? Uh, well, that's, that they say the small point is really, um, you know, not, not amenable to um, frying with olive oil. And I, I said, okay, so let's look at what the data shows. And um, a lot of studies have been done both in the lab and in kitchens uh, to show that take a frying pan in the center of the frying pan, which is the, the highest temperature, you barely hit 300 and so degrees Fahrenheit. Smoke point of, of a good olive oil is we're looking at 400 to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. So I don't think there's a lot of people who cook at 425 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so there goes that myth. Yes, you can fry and you don't have to worry about the smoke point. But the, the biggest problem with that is the sort of what follows from that is it's not so much the temperature, it's not so much the smoke point. The What has negative impact on, 
on health is the polar compounds that are released during heating of any oil. So recently, I think about a year or so ago, a group out of Australia tested different kinds of oils, uh, olive oil, extra virgin olive oil, uh, different vegetable oils. And they showed repeatedly that not only the smoke point was not an issue, but the amount of polar compounds released by extra virgin olive oil was consistently the lowest of any of the other oils. And they let the oil heat for like three hours, six hours. So the polar compounds are, are what are bad for you. So these two go hand in hand. So yes, you can, you can fry with olive oil, even your fries, even your veggies. And actually it's been shown that frying vegetables with olive oil not only gives you the benefit from the olive oil, but it also protects the, the release of phytonutrients out of your vegetables. So now you're getting a synergy of because the olive oil creates this crust around your vegetables and it captures the phytoproteins, the, the phytonutrients in the vegetables. So now you have a, an amplified effect. So um, so there goes that and, and okay, polar compounds. You definitely don't want polar compounds in, in, your, in your food. And the best way to minimize that is use olive oil because it's been shown that polar compounds coming out of olive oil for with extended you know six hours nobody's cooking for six hours but even if you go that far that long then you won't get any uh, any uh, the level of polar compounds is the lowest you could get what's the difference between extra virgin olive oil and like normal olive oil yeah so so the uh, the the international olive council set certain standards of how you classify extra virgin olive oil uh, olive oil so extra virgin olive oil and virgin olive oil are very similar the definitions are very similar they are obviously they have to be produced by olives uh, from olives um, with no uh, chemicals no chemical extraction and temperatures below 85 fahrenheit or 30 celsius uh, no excessive heat uh, as opposed to a lot of the seed oils you have to push a lot of heat on uh, canola on rapeseed or rape seeds to get canola or uh, soybeans to get soy oil. Uh, olive oil, it's from olives. Temperatures have to be below 85 Fahrenheit or 30 Celsius and no chemicals. The, the differentiation between, and, and so there's two, three points where extra virgin and virgin olive oil differ. One, extra virgin olive oil cannot have more than 0.8% acidity. And the acidity comes from oleic acid, which is the main ingredient of olive oil. So 0.8 grams per uh, per 100 grams is the definition of extra virgin olive oil. If you go above that, then you're moving into virgin olive oil. Virgin olive oil can have up to 2 grams per 100 grams, so 2% of oleic acid. Anything below that, then you go into different, uh, you go into um, oils that are not... Um, the best for you to consume. The other difference between extra virgin olive oil and virgin olive oil during organoleptic testing, meaning people are tasting and, and sort of doing chemical analysis, but also tasting the olive oil, extra virgin olive oil should have no defect. And there's a, a list of defects that you have to check off that it doesn't have. Um, as opposed to the virgin olive oil, the, you, it's allowed to have a couple of slight defects. And the last sort of difference is the, the extra virgin olive oil has to have that fruitiness. You know, when you smell it, when you taste it, it has to have that fresh olive uh, flavor and scent. As opposed to virgin olive oil, you could have that, but it's not as powerful. So those are the three so there's chemical differences and there's um, sort of tasting and organoleptic differences. But in terms of the production, they're both the same. They have to be under 85 degree um, Fahrenheit for, for the pressing of the olive. They have to come from olives and no chemicals used for the extraction of olive oil. So, in you know, if you think, about, I want to think about olive oil as sort of the product of a fruit juice. I mean, you take the, the olives, you squeeze them and you get the, of course, there's separation that happens and you remove things and then you know you get the olive oil what about olives and i think you also on the website there's also like uh, olive tree leaves yes there's... um i i think olives the research in olives is just starting now uh and likewise for olive leaf extracts uh i mean it makes sense that um a tree that gives you a product like olive oil that comes from olives you would expect that olives are good for you as well and and the leaves that come from it so uh in 2019 during our second international symposium that we put together as the yale school of public health uh data was presented by some uh, partners at the university of barcelona and they showed that the um 
the use the, the consumption of five olives daily is equivalent to taking that uh, one tablespoon of olive oil in terms of what you're getting uh, from from sort of the polyphenol content. Um, so it's just I, I think there's a lot of work now starting on looking at, at olive olives uh, as a way of, of getting those polyphenols um, and. Sometimes it might be logistically easier um, to eat olives instead of having a little vial of olive oil with you wherever you go. You can take your olives. Uh, and olive leaf extract is another um, uh, very active area of research. Australians have done a lot of work in that. There's a, a couple of groups that are really pushing to, to figure out ways how to utilize the, the olive leaf extract, whether it's in teas or extractions that can be used for um, for you know, whatever you want to use it for, but definitely that's, that's another area. And, and I think that speaks to another component of the sort of the olive tree, um, what, the impact that it has on, on, on issues like sustainability and planetary mm-hmm. health. If you think of a tree that you can use its fruit, you can use its leaves, and you can use the product from the fruit. Right there, you have three products that can be used from one tree. And then add to that the the fact that uh, it's been shown that uh, olives are a big carbon sink. The production of one liter of olive oil offsets about 20 pounds, 20 to 23 pounds of carbon dioxide. That's about 10 kilograms of carbon dioxide. So now you have a a tree that has a positive impact on on the carbon footprint that gives you something beneficial and you can even use the leaves for your health. So, you know, it's a, it's a win-win. In any, any way you look at it, it's a big plus. Um, so, and I think a lot more work is happening and it's going to happen in terms of the planetary health because that's another area we want to look at. Can we figure out ways to maximize uh, not only the human health benefit, but also the planetary health uh, and in, in, in this uh, sort of thinking of, of sustainable agriculture going forward. That's amazing, and yeah, it's. Um, I think the message here is go plant olive trees. Yes, yeah, I remember as a kid, you know, uh, there was this uh, campaigns of planting trees. I think we should have uh, we should have changed the narrative, plant uh, olive trees in a place like Cyprus that's very um, very dry, that's very uh, good for. I mean, these are the kind of climates that the trees like. So uh, plant olive trees. Uh, you get food from it, and you you do something good for the environment. I think everything that you said it is amazing and it's very interesting and it will be very helpful for people to hear. Um, I want to move on now to, let's sure. say, the last section. Do a bit of personal questions. Okay. Um, so let's say I'm a young researcher and I've just finished university and I want to get into biostatistics. Um, what do I do? Where do I start from? Well, I, I think if you think about it from a very young age, we're all dealing with data. We're all dealing with numbers, whether it's, you know, I like this better, you know, I have more of this, I have more of that. So uh, I, I think the, and if you, I, I think there's very few areas I can think where data and numbers don't come in. And, and in a way, we all do our own analysis in our own head. So uh, the starting point to me is, um, if you're in high school or in, go to college, take a course in statistics, take a course in data analytics, uh, because it will give you a different perspective on, on how um, how to look at things, even if you're in a different field. So um, don't be afraid to take, because people are usually scared of math and, and numbers, and but actually they make sense. Uh, there's no gray zone when it comes to data analysis. It's either this or not. I mean, there's no, uh, it's how we interpret it that, that creates that, the problem. So um, I would always encourage people to take a course, go outside of your comfort zone that, oh, I didn't, I didn't like math or statistics in high school. I'm not going to take anything in college, but take a course uh, just to see, because you never know how you're going to sort of, where you're going to find yourself in what, in, in your career. Um, so that's my my advice take it take a course and, and you know and i think it's it's a little bit easier probably in in academic uh environments where uh that's part of your education you have to be exposed to your elective courses that have to be outside your field um so that that's one thing i enjoyed uh coming here uh in retrospect thinking i mean i had friends who left at the same time and studied uh and and their focus was the same as mine but I took classes, you know, one of my favorite classes I took was medical geography. 
uh, as a biochemistry major, you know, medical geography was like, why are you taking that class? I took um, statistics you know, at the School of Public Health. I mean, it's like, why are you taking that? So that you have to open your horizon to, to because you never know how and when and uh, you're going to use it and where it's going to lead you to. I mean, probably the medical geography class took me in the direction of public health because I was fascinated by the idea that um, geography is destiny. I mean, you where you grow up, where you are, you live your life might determine your health. Um, so there's parameters that you cannot control, but there's some you can control. But at the same time, you know, if you look at um, sort of where do things happen uh, in terms of health, might be determined by where you are. So that that so you know, the light bulb went off. It's like, oh, that's an interesting area. Maybe I, that's where I should go. It is, it is. And I think there's another point here. The thing of cross-fertilization. Mm-hmm. Like you do something that's outside of what you normally do and it yep. can open doors of um, of like contributing with other people or collaborating, mm-hmm. etc. Yes. Exactly. Um, so what's most important in life for you? Um, well, besides my kids, um, <laughs> most important to me is sort of the, I have this, I don't want to call it struggle, but it's a continuous uh, pursuit and curiosity around trying to answer things. Uh, I feel I'm never satisfied. Uh, no, no, I'm always satisfied with what I'm doing professionally, but it's always that that longing for what's out there. Uh, and I think, again, looking back at my trajectory, uh, I would never have thought I would be starting an institute at Yale on olive oil. I mean, there's no, if you told me 25 years ago, this is what you'll be doing. I was like, no, you're out of your mind. I'll be doing this and that and the other. So, and I think that speaks to how I approach life in general. It's always curious to learn, curious to pursue something that um, it might appear not as easy at the beginning, but that to me, maybe I'm challenging myself in, in that pursuit. Uh, but it's really important for me and to sort of discover things that are um, for my own benefit, whether it has impact on, on, on others. Obviously, that's the better thing to have impact on, on other people's lives. But that curiosity has always been with me. And I, I think um, in, in a different way, you know, the, the fact that I left uh, and came as far as I could, I guess, was this pursuit of, of something different uh, and what's out there. I think this is a, a characteristic that kids have, curiosity. And yeah. sometimes it's, it's taught out of them. Mm-hmm. And um, yes. yeah, I don't know. Uh, so who do you admire? Uh, there's a lot of people, when I saw the question, I'm like, okay, who do I admire? Uh, there's a lot of question, uh, a lot of people that I admire, both from a, a lot of different uh, walks of life. But I have to say the, the person that uh, has always been well, the role model for me is my son. Wow. Um, favorite book? Uh, favorite book. Um, the, and this goes back to my point of curiosity. I, I'm one of those people who at any given time, I have four or five books started. Uh, so every time I go back to the to the book number one, I have to start, you know, go back a few pages to remember where I was. But I have to say one of the, the most um, powerful books I read it was many, many years ago, was by Hanana Shrawi. Uh, she was the Palestinian delegation representative at the Oslo uh, peace talks with Israel. She wrote, a, by, uh, she wrote her account of, of um, sort of her insight and with great integrity and told it as it was for both sides. Uh, and it's called This Side of Peace. A uh, very powerful book that I think resonated with me for many reasons because, you know, it was not... Uh, she was not coming out as, I'm a Palestinian, therefore I'm going to say things that appeal to Palestinians. I'm going to say things as a human being with my integrity and the insight I have from these conversations. And that resonated with me a lot. And and part of my sort of, I mean, we grew up in, in Cyprus with that idea of, you know, if you say something from whether you're from one side or the other, you have to please and appeal to your side. And sometimes we we are afraid to cross that line, which actually we should, um, if we want to uh, uphold our, our, um, our integrity. Mm-hmm. That's, yeah, 
I think that's good advice. <laughs> um, what about a favorite movie? Favorite movie by far, Cinema Paradiso. Uh, and again, it, you, you you hit it on the nail. It's that that kid in me who always wants to find something that is very fascinating. Uh, and I've maintained that. And I, I probably have seen that 10 times in my life. And every time I'm always amazed by how well it was done. But it, it, there's something that pulled me in from the first time I saw it. I'll be I'm honest. I, have, I haven't seen it. I haven't oh, you seen have it. to. You have to see that movie very amazing movie and i think um you know I, my kids tease me that you know you're like a little kid i'm like and there's nothing wrong with that um you know we, we all do our work and we're serious when we have to be but you have to let yourself be that kid and never lose that you know th this is interesting when you when you <laughs> hang around with, with kids you understand these things oh, and yeah. you and you be able to take uh, you take from this the same with hanging out with elders I yes. mean, you have to do both you can't just hang out with people no, at your own age exactly it, it actually somebody um, I can't remember who it was uh, like a, a known person said if you want to learn about life you spend a lot of time with people who are much older than you because they've been through life and you have to spend time with a lot people a lot younger than you because they will tell you what it, from their from their angle, so it's, it's it's true. It's true, and I think um, another thing we get from young people is how simple they sim simply they think. Because now it's just everything's yeah. too much information mm -hmm. and this and that, and they just look at the world very simply. It reduces yeah. stress, etc. Anyway, big tangent. <laughs> yes. Um, so last question: um, What advice would you give to your younger self? Um, I, I think looking back, um, I, even though I've done a lot of things out of the box, so to speak, I mean, I, I both career wise and where I've been and where I've gone, uh, I still feel I could have done a little bit better in exposing myself to different cultures, not, not through traveling. And I mean, because I've done a lot of that, but immerse myself into learning another language. Um, and I remember in college, I always said, well, I'll take Spanish next year because in Southern California, pretty much everybody speaks Spanish. I'll learn it. Oh, I'll take it next year and the year after. And I ended up not doing that. Now I, I feel that that's something that, especially being in the olive oil world, uh, knowing another language, whether Italian or Spanish would have been, and I try, um, uh, but you know, there's no, not a lot of time to dedicate to, to learning that unless I, I move somewhere where I am forced to speak the language. So that, that's something I should have done um, on that level. Now, from a personal standpoint, I, I think one of the things that I am learning is that I found myself over the years uh, sometimes compromising uh, not so much myself, but what I thought was the way forward for some things. Uh, and, and mainly because I didn't want to displease others. Um, mm. and I, I, I've learned that, well, those who are going to be around you have to accept you a hundred percent who you are very authentic. I mean, I, I think I've, I've discounted a lot of my authenticity to some degree over the years. Uh, but now I, and I think everything comes along with, you know, you're more experienced in your career. You're, you've achieved something. People see that, uh, you've grown, uh, you've matured. So that comes along with that, that, that ability to be as authentic as you can. Uh, but I think earlier on when I was younger, probably I was discounting that and, and compromising a little bit, but you, you live and learn. I can see that in myself, uh, pleasing people. Yes. I want to. Um, I want to thank you so much for this, and it's been a it's been an amazing experience and a very helpful experience for me as well, and I'm sure for other people who are going to listen to this podcast. Um, so thank you so much for doing this. Oh, thank you, Andreas, and thank you for this initiative. It's great. All the best. You too. Bye bye. <laughs>